I have a few more thoughts on the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro running on the M1 Pro and M1 Max processor. In the last video, there are certain details that I definitely didn't cover just because I really wanted to get a configuration recommendation out so that you can order a machine that you want. But now that I have some time to go over some more detail, I have a few more thoughts about that. So let's find out. This is Artist Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. In my previous video, I've talked about the new display on these new MacBook Pros that they're going to be amazing because they're LED backlight. There are certain aspects about the display that I didn't cover yet, so I want to kind of just take some time and go over them now. The one thing that I didn't mention in the last video is the fact that there is a notch, but I have a feeling that once you get used to this, you won't even notice it's there because the notch is normally where the menu bar is supposed to be in macOS anyway. And if we take a look at some of the other pictures of the other apps that Apple have shown us, even running in full screen, we can see that pretty much the notch doesn't even show up on the display as you're seeing right now. So again, I think this is one of those things where we're just going to forget that it's ever there in the first place. Now, the next thing I also ran into an article saying that when you move the mouse up to the notch, it's treated like a whole screen area. So you can hide the mouse cursor behind a notch. And I think that's really cool. So as I move the mouse up to the screen, I can just hide the cursor behind there. It's not going to just run along the notch. So that's kind of like a cool, neat thing to happen there. So something to think about. In addition to the 1080p webcam, we also get a much better audio system from the MacBook Pro. And Apple has always been a pioneer in this area. So I don't expect anything less than that from these machines. Having spatial audio on a laptop is going to be really cool. And the fact that they are putting in studio quality microphones in there with like three microphones, this is definitely going to be a big improvement, especially if you do like video conferencing on your machine, or if you want to record something on the go really quickly, I think that's going to be a fantastic tool for that. Now, the other great thing about these display is the fact that it is a liquid Retina XDR display. This is pretty much what Apple have trickled down from their Pro Display XDR, the LED backlight, the really amazing display quality, and they put it into their 12.9 inch iPad Pro M1. And now it's coming to their laptop. And amazingly, as I was thinking about all these trickle down process, I, in my head, logically, I would think that the next Apple iMac computer, for example, the 27 inch one, would also has mini LED displays on the inside. Well, Amazing enough, as I was going through all those logical thought process, I have read a few rumor sites and there's rumors that the new 27 inch iMac is going to have the liquid retina XDR display. So it's just one of those logical progressions. I kind of already see that coming, but we'll see if they actually end up releasing that product or not. But a few things that's neat about this display is number one, ProMotion. We are now going to get really smooth scrolling graphic, really smooth moving graphic on the Macintosh system. I think that's really great just from the operating system itself. Having a display that can go up to 120 hertz and a variable refresh rate is going to benefit in multiple areas, including battery life. So I think that's a really cool feature to have. Is it one of those make or break things? Personally, I would say that if you are just a photographer running at 60 hertz, it's not really a big deal. It's going to be just fine. But having a display that can move things a little bit smoother, that can show things a little bit clearer when you're like scrolling around, moving things around, is definitely going to be a plus user experience. For video pros, you generally want to set a fixed refresh rate, which you can certainly do it on here. So having ProMotion may not be of any full benefit here. However, it will just make the user experience when you're just casually working on your computer that much better. Is this a make or break feature? I say that for the most part, not so much because 60 Hertz for Creator Pro is just fine. But the fact that they put it in here, we're just going to get a much better display experience throughout. The other thing that I want to mention here is the fact that this display is what Apple called their XDR, Extended Dynamic Range. This is really changing the game for high dynamic range display because on many of the external displays that we have used, sometimes they have HDR features, but most of the time those HDR features are encoded in some type of format, whether that be HDR10, HDR10+, HLG, or Dolby Vision. So with this, what you can really do is now go into your computer and especially if you're a content creator, you can now master an HDR, or at least I'm hoping that you can do that. Because what happens is that, for instance, my camera on the iPhone 12, starting with iPhone 12, can already film and shoot in high dynamic range Dolby Vision. The problem is that if I don't bake the file out from my phone, if I transfer that file to my computer, well, it doesn't understand how to handle all those high dynamic range 
content, it doesn't understand the metadata that are in the file. And I try a couple of different ways to get the file to looking good, but what it comes down to is that it's so much easier just to use iMovie on my iPhone to compress things out and literally just share it from the phone. Now we can do that on the machine. I think this is going to be a big game changer for video pros in general, or just if you just want to create your content in HDR, I mean, this is going to be fantastic for motion. Now, if you're a photographer, is this going to be one of those things that is going to make or break something? No, but we also gain the benefit from having display to control wider brights and also darker blacks. And that's going to be something amazing to use in that aspect too. One of the things that we still have to remember though, is that depending on where you take your photography, these display are still calibrated P3 from the factory and majority of the photo standard right now are still using Adobe RGB. So two of the discrepancy to kind of just think about there, but we're going to talk about it more once I have the machine in to do the testing. Now, beyond that, we have to talk about the M1 Pro and M1 Max a little bit. After going through the processor a little bit more, we can see that there are some die size differences. But the really neat thing about this is that on the M1 Pro itself, these processors have a ProRes encoding engine on the inside. Another thing to note is that depending on how many displays you want to link up to your system, you may want to choose the processor accordingly. For example, the M1 Pro will allow you to hook up two external displays in addition to the one built into your laptop. Whereas on the M1 Max, you can link up to four external displays in addition to the one inside your machine. That's something to think about there. But what's also neat about the M1 Max is that if, especially if you do video work, well, there's double the encoder decoder engine for videos inside M1 Max. So I would say this, if you're a video pro and you do a lot of encoding decoding, I would probably choose the Max model as the base just because you are going to get that much more performance out of the processor compared to the Pro. The next thing that I want to touch on is the power adapter. So this is the 14 inch model. And if you order the base 14 inch, it comes with the 67 watt power adapter and you have the option to spend $20 more and upgrade to the 96 watt one. I recommend that you should do that because in order for you to get fast charging, you are going to need the 96 watt power adapter. If you've gone in and upgrade the processor in any way at all, Apple automatically bumps you up to the 96 one and you're good. What we can see from the power adapter is that on one end is still a USB type C. This means that you can use a third party power adapter if you choose. And the nice thing about it is that the new cord is now braided. So you have USB C on one end and MagSafe on the other end. And on all 14 inch model, you can either use a USB type C or the MagSafe to do fast charging. When it comes to the 16 inch model, you can only fast charge by the MagSafe cable. And if we take a look at the 16 inch model right now, we can see that the power brick does definitely increase in size because this is now a 140 watt power brick. And it also happens to be Apple first GAN charger. This is a new technology in charging, which allows for a smaller form factor and still deliver the same amount of power. So that's one great new technology that they're putting into the power brick here. And considering the size and the power that it can deliver, I'm glad that they actually choose to use GAN technology. There's a few more things that I want to go over. One of them is battery life. Apple is now putting a machine that has an amazing battery life now for Creative Pro so we can be on the road and edit twice as long. I mean, especially in Lightroom Classic, that's going to be cool. So when I get the machine in, we're definitely going to be running an export test with power connected and also an export test on battery to see what we're really getting out of the performance of the machine. But knowing that Apple is a vertically integrated company, meaning that they control the entire stack from the silicon manufacturing design to the operating system. I don't expect otherwise from this generation processor. So it's going to be really cool there. Now, the next thing that I want to compare is the size between the 2021 16 inch versus the 2019 inch model. I mentioned already that the weight slightly increased by 0.4 pounds. The dimension overall stays close to each other. It does increase a little bit every now and then, but I'm okay with that, especially if I'm going to get a machine with a much better battery performance and more power. I'm all in for that. And the one last thing I want to mention here is the thermal capability. Because this is running on Apple Silicon that has a much better optimized thermal output and also the new fan, I am really looking forward to test this out because let me put it this way. Every time I have to do a recording like this, and I am using my 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro, the fan would just pretty much go off like the computer is about to take off. So being able to record in a quieter environment, that is going to be really awesome. So anyway, those are 
some of my compilation of thoughts for the new 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro. Like I said, make sure you stay tuned to the channel because when I get them in, we'll definitely do a whole bunch of benchmarking and reviewing for the Pro Creative Workflow. And I'm gonna put it through the real world test so you know exactly which configuration to get or which one you should maybe consider upgrading to. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below, give this a like, subscribe and hit on the bell if you're new, and remember, in art we trust.